Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest vodcast. And this is going to be a two-parter talking about calocele abnormalities. We're going to focus a bit later on transitional cell carcinoma and some of the subtle uh, findings of the calices. But we're also going to speak about several other benign processes, which can be very confusing in clinical practice. Now, there's no doubt that CT urography is a first-line test for patients with hematuria to try to define the etiology of hematuria. Renal papillary and calocele lesions may cause hematuria and can occasionally be encountered on CT urography. They're often best seen in the excretory phase of the CT urogram, which we like to think about about five minutes post-injection. Technique becomes important. Wide windows, typically for CT, you look at 410 over 7. You want to look at 550 over 50. If not, it's very easy to obscure things. Now, you shouldn't look at one set of windows over the other. You need to look at both of them. But if you want to look at the calices, that 550 over 50 is ideal. And again, as I'll show you, it's important to look beyond the axial views. A lot of the things with calices show best on the coronal view and also show very nicely or even better, perhaps, on some of the 3D imaging. If you look at a normal collecting system, as in this case, you can see the infundibulum, the renal pelvis, a simple calyx, a compound calyx. We talk about a single calyx as a single papillary empties into a single calyx, often in mid-pole. With a compound calyx, multiple papilla empty into a single calyx, often in the upper pole, which you can see very nicely here. Now, we talk about the appearance of the normal papilla. Um, on this set of images, excretory phase CT shows a prominent but normal papilla, which can, if you look very quickly, simulate a filling defect like a stone or even a polypoid tumor. You don't want to mistake this for a tumor, obviously. Excretory phase oblique imaging, particularly with sagittal or coronal reconstructions, will make this a lot easier to really know specifically what you're dealing with. Now, the normal papilla do have a prominent blush. It's accentuated with low osmolar contrast media. Uh, therefore, the concentration of contrast media is higher than with high osmolarity contrast material. You can see it very nicely here. And this normal papillary blush in an asymptomatic patient is normal. This blush-like appearance is just normal concentration of contrast in the medulla. You need to be very careful about this. You can see it involves all the calyces, which can be helpful, but you can imagine why this can be confused with other pathology. We then talk about benign tubular ectasia in this patient with microscopic hematuria. The excretory phase images in axial and coronal and MIP images show distinct linear paintbrush. Remember that term of paintbrush? like collections of contrast in the dilated collecting ducts in the renal pyramids, which are difficult to appreciate on soft tissue window imaging, but better appreciated when we go to the wide window imaging and on the MIP. You have to think about this benign tubular ectasia with that paintbrush appearance and think about it compared to the normal subtle blush from the prior scans. Now, benign tubular ectasia and medullary sponge kidney it's a condition characterized by dilatation of the renal collecting ducts in the papilla. With benign tubular ectasia, it's an isolated finding of linear contrast collections. With medullary sponge kidney, it's contrast collections in association with urolithiasis or medullary calcinosis. So for medullary sponge kidney, think stone disease. The paintbrush-like appearance of multiple discrete linear densities in the pyramid um, that's classic, as I showed you in the case a moment ago. It should not be confused with indistinct normal papillary blush due to normal concentration of contrast. It's associated with stone disease and hematuria, particularly medullary sponge is stone disease, can involve only one, few or all of the calyces, can involve one kidney or both kidneys, it's bilateral in between 60 to 80% of cases, so that can be a bit helpful. 
Now, here's a patient with medullary sponge kidney, patient with gross hematuria, complicated history. The non-contrast coronal MIP images shows extensive small and large calcifications in medulla. The excretory phase, coronal MIP shows calcifications are located in the dilated collecting ducts. Additional densities are due to accumulation of contrast material within cystically dilated collecting ducts that do not already contain calculi. So you can see it's a combination of, of calyces with calculi and without calculi, but that blush, that paintbrush appearance is indeed very impressive. Medullary sponge kidney is an idiopathic dilatation of collecting ducts resulting in urinary stasis and stone formation. It's associated with a number of conditions like Ehlers-Danlos, Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, and Corolli's disease. Another example of medullary sponge, patient with a history of UTI and gross hematuria. The non-contrast scans show the medullary nephrocalcinosis. On the soft tissue window, you don't really appreciate that change at the interface of the calyces and the stone. The stones kind of look hidden. Everything looks the same density, but with wide windowing, you very nicely see the calcifications in the dilated collecting ducts. Additional density is due to accumulation of contrast material within the cystically dilated collecting ducts that do not already contain calculi. It should be noted that in many patients with medullary sponge kidney, the affected collecting ducts are ectatic rather than statistically dilated. Here's just another case that we had recently. Very, very impressive look at the calcifications on the non-contrast study in this patient with hematuria. Look how extensive they are on the MIP coronal views. Just impressive. It looks like all the calyces in both kidneys, upper, mid, lower pole are all involved. Here it is very nicely again on that MIP image. It's interesting when you look at the arterial phase imaging, knowing it's there, you can kind of subtly kind of see it. But it's amazing how easy it is to miss on the early phase imaging. You can see it again a bit better on the MIP imaging. It's kind of shadowing on the image on the left. But once you go to the excretory phase imaging, then it's very, very impressive. You can see the changes by the calyces involving all the calyces, or essentially all the calyces, in both kidneys. Again, the importance of the correct window width and window center, particularly emphasized on the image on the right. Here it is with cinematic rendering, giving you a feel of the extensive calcifications, their distribution, and their orientation to the calyces, shown very nicely on excretory phase imaging. So very important diagnosis that is uncommon, but is not rare. And as we look at patients with hematuria, it's something to think about. When you look at some of the facts, and let me go through a few things, it's a rare disorder that affects more women than men. It's thought to occur in one in a thousand to one in 5,000 people in the US. Although symptoms begin at any age, they usually develop during adolescence or in adults between 30 and 50 years of age. Approximately 13% of all people who develop kidney stones are eventually diagnosed with medullary sponge kidney. And again, there are certain syndromes we mentioned, such as um, Beckwith-Wiedemann, where it's more common. The first symptom of medullary sponge kidney is typically blood in the urine, stone formation, or signs of urinary infection, or burning and pain while urinating. In some affected individuals, calcium stones may form in the kidneys. These stones can cause back pain, typical renal colic or pain in the lower back. Uh, again, one of the explanations for back pain and hematuria, particularly in a younger patient, you gotta be thinking about medullary sponge kidney. In this article by Fabri, it's a kidney malformation that generally becomes manifest with nephrocalcinosis and recurrent urinary stones. Other signs may also be renal acidification and concentration defects, precalceal ductectasia, and neglected proximal tubular defects. It's generally considered a sporadic disorder. The initial non-contrast scans allow a detection of nephrocalcinosis and small stones. 
It's a good example why in hematuria we get non-contrast CT, which can be very helpful. Obviously, the excretory phase imaging gives you a real characteristic appearance, but this non-contrast can make it much easier. Again, medullary sponge typically involves all renal papilla bilaterally, but as we mentioned, it can be unilateral, involves just a few papilla. Severity of disease correlates with the extent of urographic signs. So again, it's a very variable disease and can be a bit of a challenging diagnosis. So again, let's just go through a couple things in medullary nephrocalcinosis. Deposition of calcium salts in the medulla, common causes, hyperparathyroidism, sponge kidney, renal tubular acidosis, and other conditions with hypercalcemic and hypercalciuric status like papillary necrosis. Nephrocalcinosis is the formation of dystrophic calcifications within the renal parenchyma. And urolithiasis are stones within the lumen of the urinary tract. There is significant overlap between nephrocalcinosis and urolithiasis. Calculi within the renal, medulla, or distal tubules may erode into the collecting system. So again, it's very easy to describe the differences, at least on a piece of paper. It may not be quite so easy when you're doing the actual cases. Here's a patient with medullary nephrocalcinosis. You can see very nicely the diffuse stone disease. You can see the patient had some demineralization of bones. And this, and this patient had parathyroid disease. Parathyroid carcinoma is less than 1% of all causes of hyperparathyroidism, but this patient had hyperparathyroidism. And looking at the pelvic bones and even looking at the spine is a good way of making the diagnosis. Another patient with medullary nephrocalcinosis, you can see really impressive the dilated calyces, the stones. This patient had renal tubular acidosis. Indeed, very, very impressive. When massive medullary nephrocalcinosis is seen, renal tubular acidosis is usually the underlying cause. A good pearl there. Now, what about urothelial neoplasms? Upper urinary tract urothelial neoplasms account for about 5% of all urothelial neoplasms. Assessment of the entire urothelium is essential before treatment because it's multicentric. 2% of patients with bladder cancer have synchronous upper tract disease. 6% of patients with bladder cancer will have a metachronous tumor in the upper tract. 40% of patients with upper tract urothelial carcinoma will have bladder cancer. So it's very important to look very carefully at all the areas because remember, to cure a patient with a small TCC of the kidney, you need to remove the kidney, the ureter, and, and a portion of the bladder. CT appearances of urothelial neoplasma of the upper tract can vary from a focal intraluminal mass to urothelial wall thickening with luminal narrowing to an infiltrating mass. TCCs can be very large. They can look like an infiltrating tumor, look like lymphoma, perhaps unilateral, look like a papillary renal cell carcinoma. They're typically hypovascular. And you can see a very nice example here of a patient who presented to the emergency room for gross painless hematuria. There's a mass in the upper pole. This case does make a good point. Sometimes on early phase imaging, it's easy to miss a subtle TCC when it's small because they're hypovascular. It's really on the excretory phase imaging that you could recognize the tumor best. So that becomes very important. Now, let's look at some more work with urothelial carcinomas. But let's take a five minute break first and we'll come back and pick it up with this case. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.